Um, I would like to, for you to know who's here. Uh, how many, raise your hand if you're here because you're a friend of Brad and Luke's. Raise your hand if Dwayne ever cuts your hair. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever seen Dwayne dance. Raise your hand if you've ever danced with Dwayne. Okay. How long have you known or been friends with Dwayne? Uh, raise your hand if it's been more than five years. More than ten. More than twenty. More than 30? More than 40? Wow. <laughs> More than 50? <laughs> well, I have to say, um, I kind of beat you out as more than 70. <laughs> so I'll take you back to uh, the first time I laid eyes on you. He told me he was only 39. Oh. School in Brooklyn, South Baltimore, Catholic school. The kids have to say their prayers at the end of the day and then get your coats on, line up, and the nun will walk you out. The lower kids got it first. So I was in the first grade. <clears throat> I was fast. I went out in the hallway, put my coat off the hook, and I was ready to go. And I would be first in line because I was always shortest kid for the first for the eight years at St. Rose. So I was first in line, waiting for these idiots behind me to rush. And while I'm there, the door is open to the second class, second grade classroom, and I can see that class. And they're all like this. There was a crucifix on the wall, very, you know, Catholic <laughs> classroom. And all the kids are praying, and they're looking up to the cross or to heaven, whatever. And, but there was one that just wasn't into it. She's like, yeah. <laughs> he's looking out the hallway. I don't know if we had eye contact or not. But an interesting kid. <laughs> Fortunately for me, he failed second grade. <laughs> Why that happened, I don't know, because he really was one of the most intelligent people I ever knew. Raise your hand if you agree. He was one of the most intelligent people you ever known. But I guess what it was, was his mouth. That mouth that just expressed these honest opinions and these funny things and all that probably the nun was punishing for and holding him back. Although she'd have another year with him, but maybe she liked him, who knows. Whatever it was, I got to meet him. And so uh, in the next year, we were like coloring and doing artwork, and Dwayne's a few desks down, and we we're using Crayolas. And some kids had boxes with eight Crayolas in it, some had 16. How many of you have ever used Crayolas? Yeah. <laughs> um, my father was rich, he had a bowling alley, so I had 32. <laughs> but there was a girl down there that had the one with 64, and I was not top five. I had tears of them. But Dwayne didn't have a box of Crayolas. He had like this cotton drawstring bag, and he put it on his desk. There must have been 200 Crayolas in there, <laughs> including flesh and silver. <laughs> how this man collects. <laughs> and as things went on, he, as, as he became an adult, he collected music and movies and posters and fiesta dishware and furniture and it didn't stop clothing. And so um, when we became teenagers and started to buy records, this 45 RPM market with a big hole in it, we'd go to Whalen's drugstore and I could get one or two a month we would get like 10 or 15. Plus an armful of movie magazines. But he would put like six or eight movie magazines he'd carry home with him. Also, five cent bags of Hutz potato chips. And that's Hutz on your, he ate Hutz for nearly 80 years. So, um, yeah, so he, he, he collected all these things and toys. I'd have a couple little toys. He had Super Circus and Frontier and he's always getting what he wanted from his parents. And, um, so he, um, the movie magazines he got because he had three favorites. One came later, but it was always Elizabeth Taylor, Greta Garbo, and later Barbara Streisand. So he always had things of them. Then he started to, um, oh, and he went to the movies three to four times a week, every week. 
from the time he was like five or six years old to the time he was like 20. He really did. There were four movie theaters in Brooklyn. Two were in with walking distance, two he took a bus to. But he went to the movies all the time. So anything you want to know about movies, he was a walking encyclopedia. He was also fun uh, at parties. I like to give parties, I still do. And when I was nine and 10 years old, I gave parties. And one of the theme parties we had in Brooklyn was a pound party. And then you brought a pound of something. Anybody ever had a pound party? <laughs> you bring a pound of pretzels, or a pound of nuts, or a pound of Hershey Kisses. That was always the joke. I brought a pound of kisses. We'd roll on the floor laughing about that. But Dwayne brought a pound of brown sugar. Veal, uh, liver thing that encased in case with this yellow plastic. Of course, he was the only one that would try it. <laughs> and as we grew up, he started to go to dances. We had rec centers, we had a CYO, an NYF, and a method youth He was a good dancer. Those of you who have seen him dance, you know. And even when he was like 13 or 14, he was a cool dancer. In other words, we're throwing you around with a jitterbug. He was cool. He could dance to Come Go With Me by the Del Bike. <laughs> and he was a great dancer. He would win this contest and eventually went on to Buddy Dean's show. He went as a guest and then he was elected to be on the committee. All the while he's going to Murrow High School for commercial art. And on the Buddy Dean show, he was very popular. They were always sending in telegrams, have to win Schlein and Lita Dance. The fan mail that came in. He was very, very popular. The downside was the boyfriends of the girls he danced with really hated him. <laughs> but they called Buddy Dean fags. And so they just get beat up. After they went to a Buddy Dean dance afterwards, they hang out and beat them up and all. But uh, he got through it, and then um, while he, and he was very popular, as you can imagine, recognized on the bus and everything, he went and studied with seven girls when he was in high school. <laughs> Not at the same time. <laughs> Once the teen, teen years were kind of behind him, then he started to uh, come into town and go to the bars. And one of the first places he went was Mardix. I don't know if anybody ever heard of Mardix. <laughs> Mardix was a bar, uh, became a restaurant, a French restaurant. Fabulous people worked there, like Pat Moran, Malcolm Soul, uh, and Duane was there. And it was kind of a, a, before the hippies, before the hipsters, it was kind of beatniks, a jazz combo would play. Really, I was too young to go, he was a couple years old than I. But what I heard was he was so beautiful, that there are, and men and women liked him, that some of them called him Tatsio, which is this beautiful young man in this book, Death in Venice. And every once they would they call him that, and see him when he was coming out. And then we ended up at Leon's which is the oldest gay bar in Baltimore now, and he went there for 50 years. Uh, an oval bar, sometimes seven nights a week, year after year. Very popular, very popular. And uh, all the while he was cutting hair. He started cutting hair in uh, Pikesville, at Adolph's, and then Ken Ego, Hochul Cone, had a little shop for really hip kind of bell-bottom people. Anybody know about Can Ego or ever went there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. worked there. She worked there. Uh, then uh, he got his own shop with his friend Paul. They had a shop called Hair Loft across from Mardix, uh, not Mardix, Marconi's. And then the last place was Just Her Style in Hamden. And uh, he was doing that all along. He, uh, he had an older brother, Lloyd, and he really liked Lloyd's wife, Vera, and his niece and nephew, Vanessa and Ward. I don't think they're here today. But he stayed close to them. Then, years it happened. So, all these like gay people hanging out and people that liked them, like Pat and people. There was this girl who showed up who was just beautiful. Tall and fit and happy and loved being around her. And it was Ellen. And they loved her. She was a great dancer, a great wit, a lovely person. And, and, and everybody liked her. And then one time, she and Duane decide they're going to go to the Virgin Islands for a week. And they went to the Virgin Islands. And when they came back, I, they was, I was told that they had a physical attraction to each other and that they were going to marry. And that eventually, this person would come along. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so, no matter what happened, and it was a stormy marriage, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but despite that, despite that, they have remained loving friends and partners for over 50 years. Despite that, probably their best friends. Meanwhile, men and women were liking him. The women he liked were like, uh, some were actually girlfriends, some were just friends that were girls. Elaine, Mary Michael, Carol Presta, Cindy Showalter, Christine, Margot Goldman, Anna, my sister Diane, and he had lots of, uh, he had lots of male friends, but also lots of male lovers. Uh, Bruce from Brooklyn, uh, Timmy, who had, uh, Tim Poti had Dreamland, and Michael Harriman, but always devoted to his daughter and to his wife. And also good male friends like John Stickle, and uh, uh, Jeff Stanley, uh, Jimmy Joyce, who is here today, they were friends since they were teenagers, Robert and Tim, Florian, dear Florian, one of his dearest friends, uh, Chuck, and uh, Gary and Jamie. I'm gonna kind of finish up talking a little bit about Gary and Jamie because that was where Dwayne was living when he died. Gary and Jamie are two of the most marvelous people you ever meet in your life. They, they were together for 50 years, uh, towards the end, oh, towards the end of Gary's life, he would, they have a beautiful house in uh, Roland Park, a real fun, unpretentious, fun house. If you were having surgery or something, Gary would insist you could uh, recuperate there. I did that after I had a hernia. Duane, about six years ago, seven years ago, had very serious heart surgery, so he was in the guest room. It was a great guest room. It was a private, marble lined bathroom and everything. And he was there. I remember Gary talking about it because uh, the first two or three days, Dwayne couldn't drive. But once he was able to drive, he got out to the thrift shops. And within a week and a half, Gary said he had 85 sweaters. Uh, this is the way he bought things. And also the way he uh, consumed things. He, of course, loved beer, uh, loved bourbon had to smoke at least 20 or 30,000 cigarettes in his life. <laughs> a lot of marijuana, once heroin, but he really, he was an example of an old Jewish, Jewish saying of, if you're not foolish when you're young, you won't be wise when you're old. <laughs> he became a very wise man. So living, so then Gary dies, and uh, Jamie, Gary, uh, Dwayne moved out, anyway, and a few years later, Dwayne has more heart surgery, and like, his, his lungs and heart were giving out. He was very sharp in his mind and everything, but, but he was still fun, he was still fun. And uh, we would gather there on Friday nights in the sunroom, and just an example of his wit, um, there's so many, but one example, Shirley Jones, uh, who was in Oklahoma, in Carousel, she was married in the library, for Christ's sake, and the Partridge family, she came out with a memoir about 10 years ago. And it was, Okay, but there was a controversial part that got a lot of attention, and one of it was she talked about some of her beauty secrets. And one of them was uh, for her complexion to look good, she masturbated. And so one night we were debating that in this Friday night gathering, like, why would she put that in that book? Or, well, she, should she put it in the book? Should she not put it in the book? Or, and does that work? Or this and that? And we went on and on babbling. Dwayne didn't say anything. But after we kind of ran down, Dwayne said, I don't know, last time I saw her, she looked pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he, and, um, he and Jamie shared the house. They became really good housemates uh, when he went back the second time. Every night they would take two chocolate chip cookies up to this wonderful TV room on the second floor and watch a Turner Classic movie. Or tennis, Dwayne was wild about tennis. Uh, so, I don't know how many of you know, but he had a quick death. He wanted to go. He had turned 80 in November. And uh, the heart and lungs were just not doing it. He still had a great mind, still a great wit. But, um, you know, he would hint it, I'm ready. I have a friend who uh, is kind of old, and she's having some physical problems. And she said to me, Mikey, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, I'd be just as happy. And I told this to Dwayne, and he said, that's me. That's me. So he really was ready. And the really great thing about it is he just dropped dead. One early evening was gone. No oxygen tank, no aluminum uh, walker, no hospice, no come see me to say goodbye. He just went. And so that was a pretty good thing for him to have that. I'm thinking of 
A couple of things I've heard people say, Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> and recently I heard Ricky R R Gervais say, the best thing about being dead is you don't know about it. Yeah. It's like being stupid. It's only annoying to other people. <laughs> so this is the way, and of course the idea is to stay young and to die young as late as possible. And that's what Dwayne did. He was still young as late as possible. And we are left with so many of us who have been friends with him. The way we look at the world came from a lot of his insights, a lot of his humor. And so now without him, we will just be saying, what am I doing? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.